was written and now. So, in fact, I'm going to discuss uh, discrete subgroups of, of PU21, so discrete, sub, discrete group actions on, on complex hyperbolic space. So there will be no lattices, maybe unless some lattices in the, in the Poincaré disk, which are, say, maybe not, doesn't sound as, as sexy as general lattices, okay? So uh, my, my goal is today, I would like to uh, give you a description of the complex hyperbolic space, a very low pace uh, description with subspaces and everything. And hopefully tomorrow what I'd like to do is uh, working on an example and to show you that even on apparently simple example, you can get quite of uh, quite rich geometric uh, object. So uh, let's go. So uh, the first the first thing I would like to so that will be the first part of my talk. Uh, complex hyperbolic uh, space. And I will first discuss projective models for, uh, for this object. So tell me, am I writing big enough? OK. Um, so the it begins just as for the real hyperbolic space. So we are going to pick uh, a Hermitian form uh, of signature n1 on cn plus 1, and cn plus 1 equipped with such a thing is what I'm going to denote by cn1. The blackboard is very long. I think it's the, the longest blackboard I've ever seen, so I need to take my notes with me, otherwise I will walk kilometers. <laughs> okay, and uh, associated to this uh, to this Hermitian form, we have three cones. Uh, the negative cones, so that's the set of negative vectors for this form, the zero cone, and the positive cone. And setwise, the complex hyperbolic space is uh, the, 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 the projection of the negative cone of this Hermitian form to uh, CPN. Okay? So, projective model. for H and C associated with the chosen form is the projection of V minus, uh, and this is in CPN. Okay? So, so far, it's just a set. And uh, I want to give you a few examples. So the first thing we can do is to take, well, the standard N1. Uh, I think I'm losing my, my helmet. Oh. Okay, that's okay, thank you. And this is Z1 squared plus Z2 squared all the way till Zn squared minus Zn plus 1 squared. Okay? Now, if you look at the negative cone of this, well, obviously, if this is negative, then this has to be non-zero. And in other words, this means that P of V minus is contained in the affine chart of CPN uh, given by Zn plus 1 is equal to 1. Uh, and if I look at the projection of this, uh, P of V minus is, uh, well, Z1 squared all the way 
to Zn. And so we sum them. OK, that's the unit ball of Cn, where Cn sits in Cpn as an affine chart. OK? I'm going to refer to this as the ball model of HNC. And now you see directly that if I take n to be equal to 1, then I recover the usual uh, Poincaré disk here. Now, here's a second example. This time, I'm going to look at, again, a case where n is equal to 1. So this Hermitian form is in C2. And I look at the Hermitian form given by this 2 by 2 matrix. Uh, well, what happens is, well, that's, a, that's an exercise. Prove P of V minus is the upper half plane. So, of course, it's a bit weird to put eyes here. Uh, but that's what, if you want to get the upper half plane, then you have to do it. If you put just ones, which is more natural, you get the right half plane, okay? But who works with the right half plane, okay? So now I'm looking, looking at n is equal to 2, and I'm taking the Hermitian form given by the entire diagonal matrix like this, so that the product <coughs> of a vector z with itself is z1, z3 bar, plus z1 bar, z3, plus modulus of z2 squared. And what I get, if I projectivize this as a set, H2C is uh, the set of pairs, Z1, Z2. This is a, such that two real parts of Z2 plus uh, Z1, sorry, plus Z2 squared is negative. This is just uh, easy computations. And this is called the Siegel model for H2C. Okay, now we, if n was larger than 2, I could replace the central 1 here by a, an identity matrix, and I would get a similar, a similar thing in higher dimension. Okay, so while a good exercise is to find a uh, tr projective transformation that exchange the Vol model and, and this model. That's a holomorphic projective transformation. And well, there's a famous one in, in, the, in the plane, which I'm not going to write because I probably won't be able to. Okay, and I would just like to give a little more uh, coordinates on, on this set here. So we, s we have this condition here. So what we can do is write uh, Z1 to be minus U plus IT and Z2 equals Z and root 2. Okay? Oh, sorry, I am missing something. Once I have my Z here, uh, I want minus u minus a modulus of z squared, z squared plus it. So this root 2 here is just for fun. That's because when I put my z2 in here, I want the 2 to factor here. So it's just a... And uh, if, if, if I make this choice of coordinates, then h2c, which is the same as there, you can view it as the set of, of triple ZTU in C times R times R plus star, 
with, uh, that's it. So here, what you see is that we have first an element in C cross R, and then a positive thing, okay? So it's an equivalent of the upper half space model. These coordinates are quite often called horospherical coordinates because uh, if you fix a value of u, then this point belongs to a horosphere of the space. Okay. Okay. Yes, with this coordinate, what you can note is that it is ar arranged so that zz is minus to u. Now. Well, so far I've only discussed a, a set, and if I want to make it a, a hyperbolic space, then I need to give you a distance function or a metric or something like that. So if I take two points, M and N, in HNC, so of, okay, I have an N here and an N here. Is it, uh, can you survive to this oh, ubiquity? <laughs> I think that's okay. <laughs> okay, so, well, the distance function, is given by uh, this. Uh, sorry, I should... Um, so the cosh squared of D of M and N over two is, and what I'm going to do now is to consider lift of M and N. And you see that the right-hand side here is invariant under the change of lifts. And, and it's also invariant under all projective transformation that comes from UN1, because if it, it, they preserve the Hermitian product. Okay, so this defines a distance. And uh, which is pu n1 invariant. So I'm being a bit uh, sloppy here because, of course, u n1, uh, we, we have used many different Hermitian. Yes? This part here? Okay. Uh, um, Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, so this formula here, I was saying, is PUN1 invariant. And of course, I'm calling PUN1 the projective unitary group associated to any of these Hermitian forms uh, I, I may choose. Now, uh, if you want the, the metric, then this is given by... There's a, a nice formula to, to describe it. Minus four times the determinant of Okay, so once you've chosen coordinates, you may write it this way. Uh, and here's an exercise. Check this on upper half plane. Uh, using this emission form. 
if you do this, then you will just recover the usual uh, dz over imaginary part of z. Okay. So, uh, well, the isometry group, as I was saying, uh, the, the isometry group must contain P1, and in fact, it's almost everything. So, theorem, uh, the isometry group of HNC is actually uh, generated by P1 and the complex conjugation. Okay, here I'm thinking of a Hermitian form with real coefficients, or otherwise it's not exactly the the the, the complex conjugation. But let's think of either the Ball model or the Ziegel model, where this has a meaning. Okay, so uh, as a as a group, this is the semi-direct product of P U N one and Z over 2Z, or, okay, and this is a Lie group with two connected components. One of them, the identity component, is PUN1, and the other is those elements that can be written PUN1 times the computations. In other words, these are the holo anti holomorphic isometries. So you have one component that contains uh, holomorphic isometries and the other uh, anti holomorphic ones. So if you're familiar with the, 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 the general theory of symmetric spaces, well, this is just all this was saying that HNC is the symmetric space of, uh, of PUN1. So in other words, HNC is the quotient of PUN1 by its maximal compact subgroup, which is UN. Okay? As a symmetric space. HNC is PUN1 modded out by UN. So now I would like to describe uh, totally geodesic subspaces. And, well, actually, totally geodesic subspaces in HNC, so they are subspaces of the projective space, and they come from subspaces of CN1. So in CN1, we have two kinds of nice subspaces. Uh, we have complex linear subspaces, and we have totally real subspaces. Uh, real linear subspaces, so totally real uh, real linear subspaces. So what does it mean here uh, that uh, well total uh, sorry, real linear subspaces is just a subspace of CN1 as a real vector space. and saying that it's totally real is saying that, uh, for all pairs of vectors in that subspace, uh, let me call it V. So for all X, Y in V, then X, Y belongs to R. So the restriction of the Hermitian form to that space is uh, uh, is real. So in case the Hermitian form has real coefficients, then you have one 
preferred subspace, which is R to the n plus 1. And uh, so here's a proposition. Well, totally geodesic. Subspaces of H and C are the P of V, where V is either complex uh, linear or V is totally real. Now, if, uh, here I should be slightly more careful, because among the complex subspaces in C and 1, some intersect the negative cone and some don't. So if I take a, a, a complex linear subspace that don't intersect the negative cone, then of course I get something which is empty, say, or yeah, yes. So that intersect V minus. OK, so let me give you an example. And I will give you a complete description of what this gives us uh, in H2C. So OK. So among these guys, there should be geodesics of HNC. So here's my first example. We can pick uh, M and N in uh, the projection of V0. So this is the boundary of, of H2C. And I'm going to lift them so that the product, the Hermitian product of, of lift, is equal to minus 1. You can always do that. Uh, sorry, I say minus 1 and I write 1. And then uh, the geodesic connecting m tilde to n, sorry, m to n is the projection of uh, this thing here, e t over 2 uh, m tilde plus e to the minus t over 2 n tilde 13 r. And in fact, if, you, if, you, if you're careful enough, you will see that this is actually uh, the projection of the totally real space spanned by these two vectors. Okay, so we have an explicit description of, of this. And now to check that this is indeed a geodesic, here's a little computational exercise. Using the formula for the distance I was given before, uh, you can prove that the distance between gamma of t and gamma of s is exactly t minus s. So, well, okay, here I have a t over 2. That's because I wanted unit speed geodesics. And if I didn't have it, then I would have a, a 2 going on somewhere here. Okay, so let me now uh, go back to H2C and discuss uh, its totally geodesic subspaces. So, as I was saying, we have geodesics. Now, of course, we have points, but well, let's skip points. Uh, so, we have geodesics. And then we have two kinds of subspaces, complex lines, because that's the only possibility which is left in terms of, of dimension, and real planes. So complex lines 
and real planes. So what are the uh, prototypes of this thing? So complex lines, they are just, you can think of uh, coordinate axes of unit ball in C2. So they are copies of the Poincaré disk. And you take all their images by PU21. Now, real planes, well, we said they had to be fixed points of the, of the, they are fixed points of the complex conjugation. So the, the, the um, sorry, the prototype is x1, x2. Well, maybe I should write it in a more concise way. Uh, that's going to be R2 intersected with B2C. Okay, so that's the set of real points inside the complex ball. And I take all their images under uh, PU21. And so uh, now both of them are fixed point wise by some involutions. Here we have uh, So this is just a complex symmetry. So you, you fix point-wise the first factor and you, you take the opposite of the other one. And the second one is fixed point-wise by the complex conjugation. Okay? Now, uh, okay, here we are. And as you note, so this has dimension one over R. This has dimension two, and this has dimension two as well, and that's all. So in particular, I'm saying we don't have any totally geodesic uh, hypersurfaces. So no totally geodesic hypersurfaces. And why so? Well, this is an effect of non-constant curvature. So this space here has non-constant negative curvature. Uh, so let me just, um, uh, okay. So in fact, if I look at the sectional curvatures of, of the space, so the sectional curvature is pinched between minus one and minus one four, one, uh, one fourth, and Okay, so you remember in the formula that I gave uh, uh, for the distance function, we had the hyperbolic cosine of d over 2. That 2 at the denominator was a normalization constant that makes the curvature pinch between minus 1 and minus 1 fourth. I could take another thing and get other bounds for the sectional curvature. But what will remain true is that this is one quarter pinched. So the, the bound, uh, one bound is four times the other. Okay, and the two extremes of the curvature are realized by these two kinds of spaces. So uh, uh, extreme values. So we are going to have minus one and minus one fourth. So this is in real planes, and this is in complex lines. So you see that set-wise, these two things look very similar, but, but they are, of course, not non-isometric to one another because they don't have the same sectional curvature. So, uh, well, okay. Now, I said there were no totally geodesic hypersurfaces. So this makes life a bit difficult sometimes in complex hyperbolic space uh, because, for instance, 
when you want to describe polyhedron, uh, well, you don't have canonical faces like you have, for instance, in real hyperbolic space. But still, well, you can use fair substitutes. So I'm going to give you now a class of hypersurfaces that, uh, that can be used. So equidistant hypersurfaces. So they're also called bisectors. If we take two points inside H2C, okay, I'm going to start drawing in, in 4Ds. So as long as the blackboard could be, it cannot help me much for that. So I will draw some kind of potatoes, which are complex lines. Well, you will see. But if, if, if in, at any time you're confused by my drawings, please complain. Okay, I'm going to take two points inside the complex hyperbolic space. And I want to describe their equidistant hypersurface, so the set of points which are the same distance apart from M here and N there. So here, this thing here is the complex line which I will denote MNC. So that's, if you want a precise description of it, you just lift M and N to C3 here, or what I'm thinking in, of H, in H2C, say, but it doesn't change anything if you go in higher dimension. You lift them, you take the, the complex linear span of these two lifts that give you a two-dimensional uh, vector, sub-vectors, well, subspace, and then you project it back, and that's it. Now, this is the complex line spined by M and N. It's unique. And the set of equidistant points from M and N should at least contained the points in this line which are equidistant from them. So if I draw the geodesic segment here connecting them, then I can take the midpoint and then the geodesic, which is uh, so the, well, the bis bisector inside uh, this complex line. And now if I want to, to have the whole bisector, what I need to do is to take, so this geodesic is going to be gamma. If I, I'm going to take pi inverse of gamma, uh, gamma, where pi is the orthogonal projection onto this complex line. So in particular, you see here, if I take one point on that line, well, I get a fiber of this projection, which is, and now the 4D becomes problematic because I have to draw something, but I don't care. I just draw something like that, and I'm just saying the intersect here. Okay? The intersection point is here. Yes? Well, okay, if you want to define the orthogonal projection, uh, you can define the, you can define, well, you have, okay, you can say we're in a negatively curved space and then you take the closest point projection and, and this works, but you can also define it uh, using the Hermitian product and that would be, um, well, you need to cook up a formula. It's It's not a, uh, maybe I mean, that would be dishonest to tell you do it as an exercise. But in fact, what happens is that you have M and N, then you have the, the complex span of them. The complex span of this has a, an orthogonal direction for the Hermitian form, and then you use that to project just, a, just like in a Euclidean space. So you, you can cook up a, a, a formula using the Yes, you, yes, 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 that's, this thing is, you, you, when you lift everybody to, to C3, uh, 
Yes. You, 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 yes. Well, the, 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 the thing would be Z minus Z C over C, C times C, where C uh, generates the orthogonal direction to, to that line. So it's a fairly, yes, if, if so, uh, M N C is the set of Zs where Z C equals zero. And so, yeah. Okay, maybe we can, yeah, it's a, but I promise it's not complicated. Okay, and so, well, the object I obtained is something which is foliated by a complex line, because to, to each point here, well, yes, the fiber here is also a complex line, and I obtain an object which, which is foliated by, by complex lines. Okay, to each point here on the geodesic is associated a, an orthogonal complex line, and this is my, my so uh, for all uh, gamma of t, pi inverse of gamma of t is a complex line. So the bisector of m and n is foliated by complex lines. And now, uh, the effect of uh, being non-totally geodesic is this. So let me draw a picture in the complex line uh, M, N, C. So this round complex line is the same as this non-round complex line, but only seen from top. I'm kind of using perspective in a 4D space. I admit it's a bit... Uh... So I have M here and here. Okay, so the bisector consists of all the points that project onto that yellow uh, geodesic line, which is the same as that one, that's gamma. Now, if inside the bisector I take two points, then they will project, one of them will project somewhere here and one other somewhere here. And if I project the geodesic connecting these two points, I will get something which do that, okay? So when you want to construct polyhedra, you can use these hypersurfaces to split the space in two different connected components, but studying their intersections can become a, a little messy because they are non totally geodesic, okay? Okay, so I would like to say a word on isometries. Well, just as in real hyperbolic space, you can classify them in, in three types, either they're hyperbolic or loxodromic, or parabolic or elliptic. And basically what tells you which type is which is the Jordan form of a lift. So if you have a, a matrix, say, A in ACU2, uh, uh, yes, so its Jordan form can be of two types. Either it is diagonal, so this is the Jordan form, or it is non-diagonalizable, and then you get one of these two forms. Okay? All the missing coefficients are zero, of course. And these here, so these are the semi-simple ones. And these are the parabolic ones. And semi-simple ones can be either loxodromic or uh, elliptic. So why so? Well, of course, because we're thinking of projective transformation, uh, eigenvectors correspond to fixed points.
And if you think of, uh, in this case, what you can see is that you will have either, so this is the semi-simple case, you will have either something that projectively has two fixed points on the boundary and preserves the geodesic connect them, or something that has one, at least one fixed point inside the space and acts as an element of U2. So it will preserve two orthogonal complex lines. Again, I'm drawing my, my potatoes that intersect in one point. Okay. These are two orthogonal complex lines. And if I think of, so this is an elliptic isometry. And it rotates in each of the stable complex lines through a certain angle. Well, if you think of, of U2, that's, 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 that's it. That's just it. And here, I have loxodromic isometries. And they preserve the complex line spanned by the two points. And the last kind of isometries are the parabolic ones. And maybe I want to say uh, uh, a quick word on, on parabolic isometries, because I'm going to use them uh, quite a lot tomorrow. Okay, before that, I would like just to make a point. So that's a remark. If I look at an elliptic isometry, an elliptic isometry, so if I put it under diagonal form, I get something like this. Okay, and projectively, it acts as e to the i alpha minus gamma e to the i beta minus gamma. Okay, so my two rotation angles are these alpha minus gamma and beta minus gamma. Okay, so this is what I meant by discussing U2. Uh, my remark here is when alpha different from beta, different from gamma, I get something which is called regular, okay? Um, a matrix with uh, pairwise distant uh, entries, uh, eigenvalues, so I get something which is a regular elliptic, and regular elliptic, they form an open set. They form an open subset of PU21, and, uh, well, I want to keep this in mind. So this is because if you you just perturbate this a little bit and the eigenvalues remain, remain distinct. Okay. okay, now the boundary of, of our space. So in the case of the real hyperbolic space, then the boundary we have seen could be Rn, Okay, it's the upper half plane, and you can identify the boundary to the group of transformation, parabolic transformation that fix the point at infinity. So here, it happens the same, only we don't get exactly the uh, Rn, we get a Heisenberg group. So, um, if I'm going back to the Ziegel model. So I said we had coordinates that were Z, T, U. And the boundary, so the boundary of H2C is the set where U equals zero, union one point at infinity. And now, uh, here's a proposition. 
if I take a point in the boundary, uh, sorry, if I take, uh, yes, okay, if m is equal to zt in the boundary of H2C, then There exists a unique uh, parabolic unipotent transformation transformation T such that well T depending on Z and T such that T Zt uh, fixing, sorry, infinity and mapping zero zero to Zt. So again, if we know the theory of symmetric spaces, I'm just saying that the the well this comes this comes from uh, for free, but we can do it as an exercise. Uh, uh, here, so let me just give you the the transformation here. I, I write it on the so it's not recorded. So this is one zero zero, one zero one, and here I'm going to have z root two minus z bar root two and minus z squared plus i t. This transformation here uh, maps the origin to zt and i'm claiming that this gives me coordinates on the boundary that make it the heisenberg group this parameterizes a heisenberg group so the set so this is t zt t zt z in c t in r is the heisenberg group So of course, it's not the usual way of describing the Heisenberg group. Uh, so you may have uh, met this before. So in general, the Heisenberg group, we describe it uh, as a set of upper triangle unipotent matrices. So usually we have 1, x, y, z, 1, 1, 0. That's the three-dimensional Heisenberg group, usually. But I'm claiming this is isomorphic to that one. And so your exercise is find an isomorphism between them and describe the group law. So exercise, group law in Zt coordinates and isomorphism. between the usual uh, Heisenberg group and okay okay so we have the boundary that looks like the Heisenberg group we have our isometries, we have our distance metric and everything. So what's left? What do we need? Uh, so I'm going to follow uh, Athanas's advice and discuss triangles because once you have triangles, uh, you understand the space. Are there any questions? Yes? Oh, here X, Y, Z are real. Sorry. Sorry, yes. 
But then there is an isomorphism between this guy and the guy there, which both of them are, of course, good point. Yes. Yes? Um, well, of course, if the two points are in the same fiber, the projection is a point. But I think, it, yeah, I think it's... it's uh, uh, I'm not exactly sure to see what you're doing. <laughs> yes. Well, that's, I think it's true, yes. It always intersects once. Uh, I would need to, to check that, but um, I'm kind of confident. But Okay, and so I will begin with the ideal triangles. So if we first think of the your usual Poincaré disk. Uh, well, an ideal triangle, well, you know what this is. This is just a, a triangle whose vertices are at infinity. Now, you know that there is exactly one such, such triangle. So this is an ideal triangle. I'm not making a formal definition, but I think that's that's okay, All right? So, and I'm saying there exists a unique ideal triangle up to uh, the isometric group of H1C, okay? So the only, I mean, if I have my three points P, Q, R, R, uh, I'm saying that sometimes, uh, depending on the order in which you take the, the points, you may need, a, a, for instance, a priori P, Q, R, and P, R, Q are not in the same class, the same holomorphic class. You, you need a, an anti-holomorphic map to identify one to the other. Okay? But that's why I'm putting here isom of H1C rather than PU11 or PSL2R. Okay. Now, what's the situation in higher dimension? So, I, well, I, I could draw the same picture uh, in 4 ds It would be exactly the same. Uh, so, definition. Uh, if I take PQR, an ideal triangle, then I define an invariant of PQR, which is the argument of minus something that I'm going to uh, fill in now. So I'm taking with the obvious notation, lifts of the vectors, uh, Q tilde, R tilde, R tilde, Q tilde. Okay? And so I'm claiming that this quantity here do not depend on the choice of lifts I've made, because you see each of them appear once on the right, once on the left. So I multi if I multiply by some lambda, then what comes out, the, the triple bracket here, is a mod lambda squared, so it doesn't change the argument. Okay, so that's a, a good uh, PU N1 invariant. And, well, it's called the Carton invariant. Elie Carton. And, um, <laughs> And so the properties of this invariant, oh yes, that should be a P, sorry. 
I'm quite often writing something different than what I say, so please complain. <laughs> and here's a proposition. So, first, the Cartan invariant belongs to the interval minus pi over 2, pi over 2. Second, A classifies ideal triangles up to PU21. And uh, I would need a color for that. The absolute value of A classifies ideal triangle up to isom of H2C. And three, A is equal to zero if and only if uh, PQR is contained in a real plane and A is equal to pi over 2 if and only if it is contained in a complex line. So why is this true? So Let me just, I, would, I will not do a, a detailed proof, but let me just give you the, the, the beginning of it that will, so proof, only the beginning. So if we take, uh, I'm going to assume that PQR are not in a complex line. Okay, then in that case, we can, Choose lifts so as to have PQ uh, equals QR equals 1. Oh, well, you just pick any P, then you adjust Q, then you adjust R, and you can do that. And then RP, so the third guy in the triple bracket, will be something like minus i to the e to the i alpha, or some alpha. And now, if you look at the, so this is a basis, because they don't, this guy don't live in a, in a complex line. And if you look at the matrix of, the, of the, this Hermitian form in this basis, then because our points are on the boundary, their self-bracket is zero, and then I get one, 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 it's the i alpha uh, minus, sorry, and minus it to the i alpha. Uh, sorry, I have a minus here. Okay, now, so that's the matrix of the Hermitian product. And if I compute its determinant, well, this is minus two cos alpha. Okay. That's straightforward. And because this Hermitian uh, form has signature 2, 1, its determinant should be negative. So this is negative. And so uh, cos alpha should be minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. So this gives us the first, the first part. And then, well, to see that it classifies, in fact, once you have written this, it's, it's almost done. Sorry, I was about to say this because this is a, this is a an elementary proof which is nice in projective geometry, but here is a more uh, geometric justification. Now, uh, uh, fact. So the metric I described is actually a Keller metric, and if I denote by omega the Keller form of H2C, then A of PQR 
is one half of the integral over uh, uh, any simplex built on PQR of omega. Okay, so what does it tell us? So first, uh, this doesn't depend on the, I, I was just saying there were no totally geodesic, so, uh, so this choice here of a simplex built on PQR is not unique, but it, it doesn't matter because uh, omega is closed, so the integral doesn't depend. Yes? Yes? It has to be the same somehow. Yes, yes. Yes. Okay. And so, well, if you think of the Keller form as a complex area, but then an ideal triangle in a complex line, well, if you restrict it to the complex line, then the Keller form is just uh, the area. So what you get if PQR belongs to a complex line, this integral here is the area of an ideal triangle. And if you apply the Gauss-Bonnet formula for uh, triangles, you get pi, pi minus the sum of the angles, but the angles are all zero, so you get pi divided by two, you have your pi over two there. And if PQR belong to a real plane, then the Keller form don't see uh, uh, real planes, okay? So it's zero, okay? So what happens if I move from uh, ideal triangles to non-ideal triangles? Well, I'm going to be quite sketchy about it, but it's about the same, the same spirit. So, uh, non-ideal triangle. Well, if I have a triangle PQR is determined up to isometry by the side length, the side length, so these invariants we have to take them, plus its shape invariant. And the shape invariant, what I could call it the, the Carter invariant again, is again the integral of, of omega. So each time you have fixed the, the, the length of sight, then you still have one parameter of deformation of your triangle that, that corresponds to, the, to the, this invariant here. Okay, so to finish, uh, this talk, I would like to start my, the second part. Uh, which is on discrete subgroups. And the first part will be on Zariski dense subgroups. So <clears throat> I'm going to consider gamma in PU and one. And so the Zariski closure of gamma is the smallest algebraic group of PUN1 that contains gamma. So that's the smallest algebraic group, sorry, subgroup of PUN1 containing gamma. So, uh, well, just mean a group defined by polynomial equations. That's, uh, that's okay, we're in matrix groups, so there's no big mystery here. And 
saying that a group is Zariski dense is saying that it is well the, this Zariski closure is the whole of PUN one. So Zariski dense. So it's Zariski closure is <clears throat> PU N1. So being Zariski non dense is a non, well, okay, sorry, I should say it the other way. Zariski density is a genericity property. So uh, I should say that gamma, so this is a proposition, gamma is Zariski dense if and only if it doesn't preserve any totally geodesic subspace. So, well, the reason for that is that if you look at groups that preserve, for instance, a complex line or a real plane, you can write this condition as polynomial equations in terms of the, the entries of the matrix. So it's really not very mysterious. For instance, take a, a, a group that globally fixes globally fix a point, then this point is an eigenvector. It gives you polynomial equations, and, and, and it, it's not Zariski dense. Okay? So, for instance, if you're used to uh, real hyperbolic geometry or Fuchsian groups, then the typical example of non Zariski dense group are elementary group. Okay? Uh, there is something going on. I think, uh, what, what is it? One of the two implications is not true, but right now I will not be able to. Okay? So here is our theorem. If I take gamma in PUN1 uh, Zariski dense, then it is either dense for the usual topology or discrete. Okay, so Let me prove this to you. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is to take... Uh, so G, so here's gamma, gamma is my subgroup. And I'm taking its closure, its topological closure. And then I'm taking the identity component of this object. Okay? So what I would like to do is to prove that G is either the identity or PU N1. Because then the first case means G is discrete, and in the second case it means it is dense. So, the first remark I'm going to make is that G is closed and connected. So, this is a Lee subgroup. And I'm going to call G its Lee algebra. Now, if I take gamma, so for all gamma in gamma, well, this thing here is preserved by conjugation by gamma. So gamma G gamma inverse is equal to G. And if I move to the level of the Lie algebra, what this gives me is that add gamma of G is equal to G. Okay? In other words, the normalizer, I'm almost done. 
a normalizer of G. Uh, uh, I'm going to, uh, sorry, uh, the normalizer of G in PUN1 contains uh, gamma. Okay? But now, when you look at, at this condition here, the normalizer of, of this, of the Lie algebra. Uh, what I'm meaning just the, the set of, okay, maybe I shouldn't call this a normalizer, but then that's the set of gamma for which this is true. Okay? Uh, am I being... Yes, yes, yes. Yes, okay, maybe I'm, I'm not a... Uh, Okay, and so if you look at, at this here, this is a polynomial equation in gamma. Well, because G is an honest vector space, gamma inverse is a polynomial in gamma. So, so here, star this polynomial. So N is an algebraic subgroup. and contains gamma. So it has to be the whole of PUN1. So uh, what this means is that, in fact, uh, gamma, sorry, N, uh, what am I saying? No, G, sorry, <laughs> G, is normal in PUN1. Okay? And now PUN1 is a simple Lie group. So we have proved what I was saying. Okay? Now, let me just conclude this story here. We have a corollary. So I was saying right before that the set of elliptic elements contains an open uh, subset of PU21. So the set of elliptics contains an open subset of PU N1. So now, uh, sorry, that's not the corollary. I should erase corollary and put it back here. Corollary, if gamma is Zariski dense plus contains no elliptic, then it is discrete. Each time you have such a group, uh, so this is something which is uh, true for Fuchsian groups, which is reasonable because they are a special case of PU N1, but this is false. For instance, in PSL 2C, uh, so which is uh, the isometric group of H3R. Okay? And there are examples of totally loxodromic uh, subgroups, which are Zari students here in PSL2C, that are non-discrete. Okay? And if you want to extract from this proof a more general statement, then in fact, I've called the ambient group PUN1, but I've hardly used anything else than the fact that it's simple. So if you take a simple Lie group, then a uh, Zariski dense subgroup is either dense or discrete. And then if you want to push the corollary, then you want to see, you want to know for which groups uh, 
you have elliptic elements containing uh, an open subset, then you need to have a compact Carton subgroup. So, yes? Uh, that's because the normalizer is an algebraic subgroup in P1, and it contains gamma. And gamma is Zariski dense. That's the point. So if you have a, a, a simple Lie group with a compact Cartan subgroup, then uh, uh, it has the same property. And PSL2C, for instance, has no compact Cartan subgroup. OK, I'm going to stop here because the buzzer is. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, is there any question or comments? Yes. Yes. Yes, yes. In fact, uh, that's a road I could have uh, followed. But if you take a Hermitian symmetric space, you can, you can do the same. You can define an invariant for for triangles, and in fact, that's the beginning of a of a long story uh, about. Uh, well, this is very close from something called Toledo's cycle, and uh, there are lots of works on Hermitian symmetric space of higher rank. And uh, okay, if you want to 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 learn more about this, you can check. Uh, I think there's a, a, a survey by Burger, Yotzi, and Vinhart. Uh, which is called Higher Teichmiller Theory. It's been published by Atanas. Uh, and they should give lots of details there. But yes, there is. It, it's because it's scalar, basically. So, yeah. uh, Any more questions? Uh, if there are no more questions, then uh, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.